Hi everybody, this is going to be a talk on myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. So these two diseases are both disorders at the neuromuscular junction, so where the, uh, where the terminal motor nerve meets with the muscle, and they're both caused by antibodies that are affecting a receptor that's necessary for transmitting uh, the neuron action potential to skeletal muscle action. So at some point, the nerve has to be able to tell the muscle to contract. And th these diseases affect the ability for the nerve to communicate with the muscle. Now, these should always be part of your differential when you're evaluating uh, a patient that's complaining of symmetrical weakness. Okay, so let's just go over some physiology here. Uh, the terminal motor neuron, usually a lower motor neuron, uh, it, it's going to have an action potential that's going to be sent down uh, to the terminal end of the neuron. And uh, that action potential is going to stimulate a voltage-gated calcium channel to cause an influx of calcium. That calcium is going to cause uh, the release uh, exocytosis of uh, these, uh, these granules that contain uh, acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is a, uh, a chemical that interacts with these receptors on the muscle that allows an influx of sodium and potassium, ultimately which allows the skeletal muscle to contract. Now we have also what's called acetylcholine esterase, which is sort of our, uh, our balancing act here. And the acetylcholine esterase eats up acetylcholine and degrades it so that we have a balance of the acetylcholine that's available to stimulate receptors and uh, a balance of no acetylcholine available so that we're not constantly contracted or constantly flaccid. Obviously, we need acetylcholine to contract, but if we have too much of it, the muscle is going to be uh, over tetanic. And if we don't have enough of it, the muscles are going to be flaccid. So myasthenia gravis is a relatively rare disorder of neuromuscular transmission, and it involves autoantibodies against the acetylcholine receptor on the postsynaptic membrane. So it involves autoantibodies that inhibit acetylcholine, competitively inhibit acetylcholine at the acetylcholine receptor. So you're going to have antibodies blocking acetylcholine from acting at these receptors. So you can imagine that if we have something blocking acetylcholine from doing what it's supposed to do, we're not going to be able to get muscle to contract. And because we don't get muscles to contract, this results in weakness. Now this is very rare. It only has about three cases per a million annually in the US. There's a bimodal distribution, 20s to 30s for females. Uh, females more than males usually at that age, and usually at that age it's associated with other autoimmune disorders, Sjogren's syndrome, lupus, RA, etc. And then around 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, there's another peak, particularly around 50s and 60s. And in that case, it's males more than females. There is an association between myasthenia gravis and uh, problems with the thymus, either hyperplasia or neoplasm. So anytime that we diagnose a patient with myasthenia gravis, we need to work the patient up for a uh, thymus tumor or thymus hyperplasia. And that involves uh, imaging, chest x-ray. Primarily, myasthenia gravis affects smaller musculature, so it's going to be more in the facial muscles and sometimes also in the proximal limb muscles. But particularly, myasthenia gravis presents a lot with facial muscle weakness. So a lot of times on the USMLE, I would imagine that's how you're going to see it. The patient's got a hard time keeping their eyes open, not because they're tired, but because their eyes are weak. They're having a hard time talking because they can't move their jaw musculature. They're having a hard time chewing. And then sometimes they can have proximal limb weakness. In really severe cases, they can have respiratory muscles that are affected, and so they'll have a hard time breathing, really shallow, rapid breaths. And that phenomenon is termed myasthenic crisis, and that's a medical emergency because these patients are having a hard time respirating. Okay, so let's talk about how we work up myasthenia gravis. Well, actually, let's talk about uh, what it looks like. So here we have our uh, here we have our anti 
acetylcholine receptor antibodies. They're just blocking acetylcholine from acting at the receptor so we don't get contraction of the skeletal muscle. Okay. So the history of a myasthenia gravis patient, uh, usually it's muscle weakness, always it's muscle weakness of insidious onset. This isn't something that comes on all of a sudden. This is something that develops over weeks. Most patients present with some kind of head or facial weakness, particularly of the eyelids uh, or the face or neck. Now, most of the time myasthenia gravis is a symmetrical weakness, but when MG presents with uh, weakness of the eyelids, that can sometimes be in one eye or the other because those muscles are so, so small. So in that case, you can have a unilateral presentation. But other than that, if it affects any other muscle, it's generally going to, there's generally going to be a uh, symmetrical distribution. The symptoms of myasthenia gravis, of course, are weakness of head and neck muscles, most commonly, or the smaller proximal muscles. Intraocular muscles can be associated with diplopia, so if you have weakness of your medial rectus or your lateral rectus, uh, that can result in diplopia, double vision. And then, of course, you can also have dysarthria, which is uh, muscle impairment that results in uh, disorder, uh, not disordinated, but uh, discoordinated speech. So you're kind of slurring and sounding nasally. Uh, dysphagia, because you're not able to chew, you're not able to swallow very well, those can also be present. So anything that causes a problem with the facial muscles, whatever can result from that can be a presentation for myasthenia gravis. On physical exam, uh, you would see abnormalities that are noted on the cranial nerves as well as on neurologic examination, but particularly on those cranial nerves because they focus on the face. You're going to have difficulties uh, with, um, with moving the facial muscles. You're going to have difficulty moving the eyelid. You're going to have uh, difficulty uh, showing a full grin. Uh, you can see ptosis, as mentioned before, but you're not going to see any meiosis here. So this is not Horner syndrome. All you have is a droopy eyelid. You don't have meiosis. When you pull the eyelid up, it should be reactive to light. You can also have facial muscle weakness and the slurred and nasal speech like dysarthria. But most importantly, what happens with myasthenia gravis is that the weakness does not improve with repeated use. So if you try to get them to open their eyes multiple times, it's not going to get any better. It actually will probably get worse or any part of their face or of a muscle that's affected. It's not the weakness is not going to improve with repeated use, and we'll see that that stands in contrast to Lambert-Eaton syndrome. And then, also important with myasthenia gravis, this is purely a motor disorder at the neuromuscular junction, so there are no sensory abnormalities whatsoever. If there are sensory abnormalities, you should probably be thinking about something else. As far as diagnosis, when you suspect that myasthenia gravis is the diagnosis, so long as the patient is stable, so long as they're able to breathe, uh, and they're not desaturated or anything, the best initial step in diagnosing myasthenia gravis is to get an anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody titer. And this also should be accompanied with chest imaging to rule out a possible associated thymoma. Thymomas are very associated with uh, myasthenia gravis, so we want to look for that as well. So the initial step is going to be the antibody titer, anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody titer, the most accurate test, however, is an EMG because that will show that we have a weakness in the nerves and that weakness does not improve with repeated use. Now, there is something called the Tensilon test with edrophonium. Uh, well, here's uh, a thymoma. We'll come back to this. Oops. Uh, got a lost here. Okay, so there is something called the edrophonium test, uh, otherwise known as the tensilon test. What this is, edrophonium, is it's just a, uh, a really uh, fast-working acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So what it does is it allows for more acetylcholine to be present for a short period of time. And so because the problem with myasthenia gravis is that you don't have enough uh, you've got an imbalance between the uh, open acetylcholine receptor sites because of the antibodies and not enough acetylcholine to balance that out. If you put more uh, acetylcholine into the, uh, to the synapse, uh, 
then what's going to happen is that those antibodies are going to be uh, balanced out by the uh, extra acetylcholine because you're not eating as much of the acetylcholine with the acetylcholine esterase. So you should get a resolution in symptoms. And so here's a patient here, and this one on the left, you can see they've got symmetrical facial weakness. Once you administer edrophonium, you get a reversal in the weakness. But this is only going to last for a little bit, and then they're going to go back to what they were as usual. So this is untreated myasthenia gravis here, and then treated. So they go back to what they should be normally, but then after a while, the edrophonium wears off, and they go back to their untreated myasthenia gravis state. Okay, this here is a thymoma. You would typically see this in a myasthenia gravis patient, very common. This one's very large. You can see here that there's also some metastasis to uh, what looked like the hilar lymph nodes right here. And then here's another thymoma. Okay, now what I want you to remember is that the edrophonium test can be used clinically, but it is neither the best test for diagnosis, nor is it, uh, is it a definitive test. So for myasthenia gravis, the best initial test is going to be to get those acetylcholine, uh, anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody titers, and the most accurate test is going to be an EMG. So it, the, the edrophonium test does not play any role in diagnosis, but classically it's mentioned, so it's good to know that. But for the USMLE, you're not going to use that as a treatment or as a mode of diagnosis. Okay, treatment. So for the stable patient with myasthenia gravis, and by stable I mean primarily airway and breathing, the best initial step is going to be an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So that's just like the edrophonium. However, these are going to be longer lasting so that it can actually be sustainable as treatment. So examples would be pyridostigmine, rivastigmine, or neostigmine. If the patient is under 60, regardless of what the chest imaging looks like, Treatment should also include a surgical thymectomy. That has been shown to improve symptoms over the long term. Now, most patients are going to respond to acetylcholine esterase inhibitor therapy. However, if they don't demonstrate sufficient improvement, then the next line is going to be immuno immunomodulation. So either with steroids or with steroid sparing agents. So uh, generally, we give both. Uh, but we try to stay away from using steroids uh, too much because of the long-term side effects, weight gain, uh, renal issues, etc. So that's why we have these so-called steroid sparing agents, because they allow us to use less of the steroids. So steroids, yes, we do use prednisone, but we also use these steroid sparing agents, particularly azathioprine. But you can also use cyclosporine or cyclophosphamide, and there's also, also other drugs that are probably out there too. But azathioprine is the big one. So if the patient doesn't respond to acetylcholinesterase inhibitors alone, then you can start therapy with steroids and steroid sparing agents, prednisone and azathioprine. Now, uh, myasthenia gravis, it is an autoimmune disorder, so like any other autoimmune disorder, uh, it can wax and wane in severity. So some patients who are controlled on acetylcholine esterase inhibitors may at some point require therapy with steroids and steroid sparing agents, and then they can be tapered down and then they can be back on their uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. Uh, that's pretty common. And what's going to cause flare-ups? anything that causes an increased production of antibodies, so particularly infections and uh, traumas like surgery. Also worth remembering that there are certain medications that are associated with neuromuscular weakness, and so we should try to avoid these medications in patients who have myasthenia gravis. And the one that comes to mind is aminoglycosides. Aminoglycosides are often associated with weakness, and they can worsen or precipitate myasthenia gravis symptoms. So a patient could be uh, without symptoms prior to, but then they start on gentamicin, for instance, and they have symptoms of myasthenia gravis and you wind up diagnosing that. So it can precipitate uh, myasthenia gravis for the first time, but usually aminoglycosides will worsen your myasthenia gravis symptoms that already exist. So try to avoid using aminoglycosides in patients with myasthenia gravis.
Okay, so this is how the treatment works. So the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors block acetylcholine esterase, and that allows for more acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction because you're not breaking it down as much. You're getting just as much release, but you're not getting the same amount of breakdown. And so you've got more acetylcholine in the synapse. And so the result is going to be uh, that the acetylcholine will hopefully outbalance the, the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Because remember, those are in a, uh, a state of, uh, of, uh, of flux. So uh, usually the problem is, is that you have too many antibodies and the acetylcholine can't get on there. But if you have more acetylcholine, you can actually saturate then uh, with, uh, out-saturate the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies so that uh, they're not as effective because they're competitive inhibitors of one another. So the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor is how we treat myasthenia gravis. So remember what I said about myasthenic crisis. So this is a serious concern and it's a medical emergency in patients with myasthenia gravis. And this is a problem where you get neuromuscular blockade of the respiratory muscles. So not being able to move your eyelids or your facial muscles is a pain in the butt, but not being able to contract your respiratory muscles is life-threatening. And so how do we see this? We see this patients having a decreased ability to breathe, shallow breaths, difficulty coughing, difficulty getting rid of respiratory secretions, and these patients are generally in respiratory distress and they're deoxygenated on their pulse oximeter. So on physical exam, you'll see desaturation on their vitals. A lot of times you'll see rails, ronchi, and wheezing because they're not able to get their respiratory secretions out of their lungs. So you're going to hear uh, some of those uh, lung sounds. And usually it's going to be diffuse because it's happening everywhere. You'll hear shallow breathing because these patients won't be able to get a deep breath, but they still have a drive to breathe. They have oxygen hunger. So they're going to be breathing rapidly, but it's going to be really shallow breaths because they can't contract those respiratory muscles uh, as they should because they have a lack of acetylcholine. Um, well, I should say uh, they have the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies and not enough acetylcholine to balance them out. You'll also see acute signs of cyanosis. A lot of times these patients will be anxious, just like any other patient who's desaturated. And other signs of myasthenia gravis may also be present, such as the facial muscle weakness um, and so forth, like those patients we saw. The treatment here, because they are in respiratory distress and they can't breathe uh, to keep themselves alive, it's going to be immediate rapid sequence intubation. You'll want to have neurology and anesthesiology on call. And the immediate treatment is going to involve plasmapheresis or IVIG. And what that does is it takes out the bad antibodies, replacing it with normal antibodies. So you're, you're filtering out all the bad stuff. Um, the IVIG is just a, an antibody for the antibody. So that way it sort of deactivates the anti-acetylcholine antibody antibody. So you're deactivating the inhibitor. Uh, but either of those therapies are equally uh, efficacious. Of course, these patients will also be needed tr to tr be transferred to the ICU because they're intubated uh, and they'll need to be monitored closely. You'll want to have labs on these patients, particularly ABGs. And uh, many of these patients also have an underlying infection or trigger for their crisis. There's also something called a cholinergic crisis, and this is going to cause you some problems when it comes to diagnosing patients. So remember that we had the myasthenic crisis. Well, the cholinergic crisis is kind of similar to that in that a lot of these patients have difficulty breathing, but these patients have their problems due to a toxicity from their treatment. So one isn't treated, the other is too much treated, but they have similar symptoms. So the way you're going to tell this apart, they both have difficulty breathing, but with acetylcholine toxicity, you also have your so-called sludge symptoms. So sludge is a toxicity of acetylcholine, which of course we would have if we had too much acetylcholine esterase inhibitor medication. And uh, that sludge stands for salivation, lacrimation, urinary incontinence, diarrhea, GI upset, and emesis.
So these patients will present nearly identical to myasthenia gravis or even myasthenia gravis crisis, but these patients are on myasthenia gravis medication and they've got these sludge symptoms. You would not expect these sludge symptoms to be present in a patient acutely presenting with, with myasthenia gravis or with the myasthenic crisis. As far as diagnosis, you can really only diagnose this clinically. Um, you may want to, if, if this patient never, uh, usually the patient has been diagnosed with myasthenia gravis before because they have these medications, um, you, can, you can get an antibody titer, but often it's useful to have your ABGs just to see where their oxygenation is. And uh, the treatment for any kind of uh, cholinergic poisoning, if you have too much acetylcholine, is going to be anticholinergics such as atropine. It's most important for the USMLE is to just recognize what a cholinergic crisis looks like. And if you have too much acetylcholine, it's going to be sludge. Salivation, lacrimation, urinary incontinence, diarrhea, GI upset, and emesis. And it may also have seizures as well. And you can also see this in like organophosphate poisoning and so forth. Treatment is atropine. Okay, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, LEMS. This is another rare disorder and it also involves neuromuscular transmission, but this involves antibodies to the voltage-gated calcium channels on the presynaptic membrane. So whereas myast myasthenia gravis was on the postsynaptic membrane, on the muscle, this is on the presynaptic membrane, on the nerve. And a lot of times this is coincident with small cell carcinoma of the lung, about 50 to 70% of the time. So more often than not, when you have a patient with Lambert-Eaton syndrome, they also have small cell cancer of the lung. The symptoms are similar to uh, myasthenia gravis that involves weakness, but usually uh, this is going to more so involve proximal limb muscles rather than the facial muscles. It can involve the facial muscles, but not quite to the degree that myasthenia gravis does. So proximal weakness, usually upper body, without sensory abnormalities. The big thing here is that unlike myasthenia gravis, weakness is going to improve with repeated use. So you have the patient use their arms and push on your hand. The more they try, the stronger they get. It's the total opposite from myasthenia gravis. And the diagnosis here, the best initial step is to get the anti-VGCC antibodies, anti-voltage-gated calcium channel antibodies. Just like in myasthenia gravis, where the best initial step was to get the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies, the best initial step for LEMS is to get the anti-voltage-gated calcium channel antibodies. And just like myasthenia gravis, the best, most accurate test is an EMG. Workup should always include lung imaging, and generally because the, uh, because the risk of small cell cancer is so high, more patients with LEMS uh, have lung cancer than not, we're going to just go right to a CT or an MRI because the probability is so high. Because we can get a chest x-ray, but we're going to have to get a CT or MRI anyway, so it's better to just go straight to the CT or MRI because we want to make we want to really rule it out because LEMS is so coincident with small cell cancer. So this is just an idea of how it looks. So Lambert-Eaton syndrome is anti-voltage voltage-gated calcium channel antibodies, and so the problem starts off at the very beginning. You get your action potential coming down the nerve. The action potential is supposed to stimulate this voltage-gated calcium channel to allow calcium in. Think of the name, voltage-gated calcium channel. What do you have coming down the nerve? You've got a voltage. Well, if you get that voltage coming down, you stimulate the VGCC to open. If you have antibodies sitting on the outside, though, you're not going to get your calcium to come in. And remember, that calcium coming in is responsible for the exocytosis of those acetylcholine granules. And so without the, uh, without the, the voltage-gated calcium channel working, we can't get exocytosis of acetylcholine, and that's going to basically result in the same thing as myasthenia gravis. Now, the reason that this improves with more, uh, more exertion is because if you continue with the exertion, what you're doing is you're building up the potential here. You're building up the voltage in the neuron. And ultimately, it's going to pull this voltage-gated calcium channel open enough to where calcium will be able to come in. But just remember that Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome improves with uh, 
uh, activity, and myasthenia gravis worsens with activity. And then this is small cell lung cancer. And uh, you can see here, this is a CT. This is uh, obviously done with contrast. This is the aorta, ascending aorta here, descending aorta, vena cava. And here's your trachea, the wider air-filled tube, and your esophagus is the smaller air-filled tube. And right off of your trachea is a cancerous nodule, and more cancerous nodules here. And so this is obviously a small cell cancer, or sorry, a, uh, a, um, a uh, central carcinoma of the lung. Remember that small cell and squamous cell are central, and so we know this is a central uh, a, a central cancer, so it's either small cell or squamous. If we already know, though, that this patient has LEMS, we can pretty much uh, we can pretty much bet the farm that this is going to be small cell cancer of the lung. But uh, just based on CT, this could just as easily be squamous cell cancer. So the treatment for Lambert-Eaton syndrome. If the lung carcinoma is present, and the treatment is going to be geared towards that, as you treat the lung carcinoma, that generally uh, improves your symptoms. For patients that don't have cancer, we're going to use medical and immunological therapy, and the treatment is pretty similar to myasthenia gravis. So the initial step in therapy is going to be acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, period of stigmine or neostigmine, and all we're doing here is we're increasing the amount of acetylcholine. Because we can't increase the amount of acetylcholine via the natural way through these voltage-gated calcium channels and through exocytosis, uh, we're just going to increase the amount of acetylcholine uh, available uh, by blocking the acetylcholine esterase. However, the problem is, is that uh, unfortunately that's not quite as effective with, my, uh, with Lambert-Eaton as it is in myasthenia gravis. So oftentimes patients will need prednisones and steroid sparing agents uh, to be added on to their therapy. And in case uh, that doesn't work, there's always plasmapheresis or IVIG for them as well because this is a disease of antibodies, which of course are in the serum. So we can, uh, we can always flush out their serum and replace it and that would uh, get rid of their symptoms at least temporarily. The only thing to differentiate this from is botulism, and a lot of times this is going to be able to uh, be differentiated based on the clinical history. Botulism often has a history of diarrhea and vomiting as it's a foodborne illness, but it can have a similar weakness and paralysis. But one big thing to note is that in botulism, the pupils are often dilated and fixed. Uh, whereas in Lambert-Eaton syndrome and myasthenia, uh, myasthenia gravis, for that matter, the pupils are normal and reactive. So that would be the one thing that would help you tell the two apart if you don't have a clinical history uh, or any other way of figuring out the two. So just to recap, uh, myasthenia gravis is caused by anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Primarily it's in the face can be in the proximal limb muscles, it worsens with activity, diagnosis best first step is titers for acetylcholine receptor antibodies, and the treatment is going to be uh, an uh, anticholinesterases, like period of stigmine, you also have to get a thymectomy if the patient's younger than 60, uh, alternate therapies uh, if anticholinesterases aren't enough are steroid and steroid sparing agents, and then plasmapheresis and IVIG if the patient is in, uh, if the patient is in crisis. With Lambert-Eaton syndrome, you have anti-VGCC antibodies, and a lot of times this is caused by small cell lung cancer. The region is primarily going to be proximal, but you can also have facial weakness. Weakness is going to, of course, improve with activity, and this is what separates these two most prominently. Diagnosis is also going to be titers, but they're going to be the anti-VGCC titers. An EMG is also going to be important for diagnosis, as well as a CT or MRI for lung cancer. And then treatment is going to be the underlying cause uh, if it's cancer. And then we treat this with anticholinesterases, uh, steroids and steroids bearing agents, as well as plasmapheresis and IVIG, I should say IVIG.